Spinex seeks to advance electromechanical devices that attach to the body or are implanted inside the body that emulate or even extend human physiological function. I first became interested in Binex um, when I suffered frostbite to my biological legs in 1982. Now, I, I got frostbite from, I was out mountain climbing, but I wanted to jump back on the horse because I'm passionate about climbing. And uh, the, the question was, how, how might this be possible? So what I did is I took a, an, uh, an approach to getting back to the vertical world of just designing lots and lots of different gadgets. My closets were just filled with legs. I had some feet that would wedge into rock fissures where the human foot cannot even get into. I have uh, feet that can penetrate ice and a vertical ice wall. And I could, you know, with these feet, I could climb thousands of feet and never experience calf fatigue like my poor colleagues with biological legs. It's, it's really sad. So through this technological advancement, I was actually able to climb better with artificial limbs than I achieved with normal biological limbs. In fact, I was the first person in history uh, to go back to my chosen sport after losing a major part of my body. Oh, there we go, great. Let's go forward now. So there you see the spike foot. So I was the first person to go back to elite levels in the sport after losing a major part of my body. And naturally, my, my climbing colleagues, uh, some of them got really peeved and competitive with me. And one person actually said, I'm gonna cut my legs off. <laughs> and uh, well, he, you know, turns out he never did amputate his legs. In fact, he was maybe is a little uncertain about his claims of cheating. So there's another person in, in recent times that have been, has been uh, accused of cheating. You may have heard of this guy, Oscar Pistorius. He was born in South Africa without fibula bones, and his family had to make the very difficult decision to allow doctors to amputate their 10-month-old uh, baby boy's legs for a dream of a better life using prostheses. Now, as many of you know, Oscar Pistorius was banned from the Beijing Olympics. The IWF claimed, the governing body of the Olympics, claimed that his cheetah prosthesis actually gave him an unfair competitive advantage in, in sprinting. And this, naturally, this provocative claim got the attention of the legal and scientific communities of the world. It was appealed to a higher court, the Court of Arbitration for Sport. I was an expert witness along with my colleague, Roger Cram. Now, the science behind these uh, cheetah prosthesis is very immature. There's only about five papers, peer-reviewed papers on the topic. Five, not hundreds, not thousands. There's major portions of the race that have never been studied. The acceleration portion of the race, there's not a single data point published in a peer-reviewed journal. Running around a curve with these cheetah prosthesis, never studied until there's a comprehensive, global, generally accepted scientific understanding of whether it's an advantage to run with these things, it's neutral effect or disadvantage, we can't discriminate against people. It was the, uh, the uh, agreement among all the arbitrators in this hearing that they should let Oscar run, that there's insufficient evidence to support an overall advantage in the 400 meter sprint race. So and that's just what happened last summer in the Olympics. Um, Oscar ran, making, uh, making history. Extraordinary, huh? So the case of Pistorius puts forth a critical dilemma. Clearly, we should architect a society without discrimination, a society of inclusion. Whether you're, you, you have colored skin or your sex or your religion, your creed, or your body type in the case of Pistorius, we should allow people to participate in events such as the Olympics. If, if a person qualifies athletically. But in this age where prosthetic technology is accelerating, it's getting better and better, we have to ensure fairness of sport. The solution to this dilemma is more technology, better technology, not less technology. Imagine a future in which we had the capability of designing and fabricating a bionic limb that closely emulates the biological counterpart. In that future, that limb would be the Olympic-sanctioned limb. Because after all, the Olympics is a celebration of biologically derived performance limits. But the Paralympics has no such constraint. The Paralympics is a celebration of human-machine 
performance limits. That will soon, I predict, exceed that capability of what normal biological bodies can achieve. I predict there'll be a day in the century where the jumping heights and running times within the Paralympics all exceed those in the Olympics. So perhaps in the, the Olympics of 2050, spectators will be completely bored by watching dull, normal biological bodies perform, and they'll all rush to the Paralympics to see this the extraordinary might of human machine capability. So Pistorius um, is a watershed individual because he's, he's forcing us to ask critical questions about what it means to be human. Should we view Oscar's legs as separate devices from his body, or should we view them as part of his body? If there's a medical device that attaches to the body or is implanted inside the body, should we view that device as foreign or separate or unnatural, or should we view it as part of the body just like the heart is part of the body? As we march into the century, the emergence of machines with our bodies and minds will become extraordinarily intimate we will experience a technological embodiment. And, and through that technological embodiment, our capacity to differentiate between our biological bodies and our technological selves will diminish. Critical to such a technological embodiment is the advances of what I call extreme interfaces between the human body and devices. Today I want to talk about two extreme interfaces, dynamic and electrical, and then I'm gonna give two examples of how even today, bionic technology is affecting people. So st starting off, extreme interface dynamic, how can we build a bionic limb that embedded in it has what it, what it means to be human in terms of how we move? How can we do that? Years ago, in collaboration with a tissue engineer, Robert Dennis, we built a hybrid robot that was powered by living muscle tissue. And under microprocessor control, we stimulated the muscles to elicit a movement of the tail. We were so inspired by the resulting natural dynamics of this robot. But it's hard to use living muscle tissue. It's hard to keep it alive. So years later, we asked, can we really do the science and fundamentally understand how humans work and then embed that intelligence into synthetic structures? So synthetic structures will move as if they're made of flesh and bone. So here we've mathematically modeled the muscles and tendons and how the muscles are controlled neurally. And then we bet, embed that into devices. So I'm wearing a bionic limbs. Both limb has several, several computers, sensors. Its structure is biomimetic. It has muscle-like actuation. There's a, there's a spring in there that represents the Achilles spring. And it's controlled in a reflexive manner. We've captured the essence of how the calf muscle, your calf muscle, is controlled by the spinal cord. So when I walk slowly, it's spring-like as it should be, as the biological ankle is, but as I speed up, it gives me more and more energy, just as an emergent behavior. And I can do things now that I never could do before, like play tennis. I'm no longer disabled with bionics. Another extreme interface, thank you. Another extreme interface is electrical. So you see in this image, T is a muscle, V is a nerve, and you see sprouting coming out of the nerve and attaching to the muscle. This tissue engineering strategy is now being used by researchers to try to build an interface with a nerve that's been cut or transected. So you see uh, cells that have been put in, skin cells and muscle cells, and that coaxes the nerve to grow again attached to the cells. We can then put electrodes in the muscle cell, which amplifies the nerve signal, the descending signal. And we can take sensory information from the bionic limb and stimulate through the cutaneous axons and close the loop between the human and the machine. One day, when this is fully advanced, probably two decades from now, it'll enable amputees to not only walk across sand, but to feel sand against the prosthetic foot. Researchers are working on an implant that goes into residual muscles that measures the amount of electrical pulse of the muscle and sending that out wirelessly to machines like these bionic limbs. Recently in my lab, we hooked my calf muscle to these bionic limbs. So I could fire my muscle that was measured and then that directly controlled the bionic limb. When I walk st down steps, 
I didn't fire my calf muscle. Why? Because I didn't want power. I was walking down steps. When I walked up steps, however, I, I fired my calf muscle, and it powered me up the steps. I became very emotional. I felt a deep connectedness to the bionic limb that I'd never felt before. It was the first time that I wasn't in the back seat of the car. I was in the front seat. My hands were on the steering wheel, and I was driving. I thought the descending signal went down, and it affected the bionic limb. I felt a deep connectedness. So on being bionic means having the experience of technological embodiment. These are not tools to me, like a hammer is a tool. These are part of my body. They have defined my physicality. They have extended my, myself, my identity. When I walk, they sense my postures and reflect their posture. When I push on them, they push back. When I move, they store energy and catapult me forward. It's a symbolic relationship between flesh and machine, extending well beyond the digital age in terms of connectedness and embodiment between humans and machines. So I'd like to now introduce you to two individuals, Ed Skowski. Um, Ed was a Vietnam vet, and this is his story as told by CNN after being fit with a bionic limb. Thirty-nine reconstruction operations. And I'll conclude my talk with a, uh, another story. Stefan Hendrick. Uh, Stefan is also a Vietnam vet, and you're about to see this video where he, he becomes emotional after receiving a bionic limb for the first time. This, this underscores the extraordinary impact technological embodiment will have on the individual. We're getting a glimpse now of a new age where we will carefully integrate technology with our very nature, an age in which our, you can't differentiate from our biology and the device, an age in which you can't differentiate between what is human and not human, and what is nature and what is not nature. It'll be completely blurred, the boundaries. So I finish with Stefan's video.